S.R.O. by Harlan Ellison. Originally published in the March 1957 edition of Amazing Stories. Republished in a collection of the author's short stories entitled The Beast That Shouted Love at the Heart of the World in 1969. Read by Daryl T. Smith II for my channel, Quasar Spectra. S.R.O. Barchester was walking down Broadway when it materialized out of black nothing. He was giving Eloise the line with the, No, honest to God, Eloise, I mean, if you come over to my place, we'll have just one, so help me just one, then we'll be off to the show. He was acutely aware there might not be any show that night, chiefly because there was no money that night. But Eloise didn't know that. She was a sweet girl, and Bart didn't want to spoil her with luxuries. Bart was just figuring mentally how many it would take to get Eloise's mind off a show and onto more earthly matters when the whine began. Like a thousand generators spinning at top point efficiency, the sound crawled up the stone wall encasing Times Square, bouncing back and back, reverberating thunderously amid the noise of Broadway causing heads to turn, eyes to lift. Barchester turned his head, lifted his eyes, and was one of the first to see it shimmer into existence. The air seemed to pinken and waver, like heat lightning far off. Then the air ran like water. It may have been in the eyes, or actually in the air, but the air did run like water. The sky gleam faded from Barchester's eyes, and he never did get that little one with Eloise. He turned away from her splendid charms, realizing, knowing, sensing that he had a place in what was coming. Others must have felt the same way, for traffic on the sidewalks was slowing, people turning to stare into the evening darkness. All seemed awed by the sight. The coming was rapid. The air quivered a bit more, and a form began to take shape, as a ghost emerging from mist. The shape was long and cylindrical, protuberated and shining. It materialized over Times Square. Bart took three rapid steps to the edge of the sidewalk, his eyes searching into the glare of neons, trying to see more of that weird structure. People jostled him, and a knot began to form, as though he were a catalyst for some chemical action. The thing, and Barchester had been in show business too long to jump at snap labels, hung there, suspended by hangings of nothing, as if waiting. It stretched up out between the trench of buildings, towering a good ten feet over the tallest one. The structure, whatever it was, appeared to be over nine hundred feet high. It hung above the ground, over the traffic island dividing Broadway and 7th Avenue, the flickering of a million lights coloring its smooth tube body. Even as he watched, the seemingly unbroken skin of the structure parted circularly, and a flat plate emerged. The plate was dotted with small holes, and in another instant a thousand metallic filaments pushed through the holes. Rigidly, they weaved in the air. Newspaper stories of the last few years, coupled with a natural childlike credulousness, joined. My God, thought Chester, and somehow knew his assumption was correct. They're testing the atmosphere. They're finding out if they can live here. When he had said this to himself, the greater implication struck him. It's a spaceship. That, that thing came from another planet. Another planet? It had been many months since the Emery Brothers Circus, in which Bart had sunk all his ready cash, had folded. It had been many months since Bart had paid his rent, and not many less since he'd had three full meals in one 24-hour period. He was desperately looking for an angle. Any angle. Then, with the innate entrepreneur blood coursing through him, beating fiercely, he thought joyously, Good God! 
What an attraction this would make. Concessions, balloons saying souvenir of the spaceship, popcorn, peanuts, cracker jacks, binoculars, pennants, food, hot dogs, candied apples. What a pitch. What a perfect pitch. If I can get to it first, he added, mentally clicking his fingers. He hardly saw the wildly gesturing policeman using his call box. He hardly heard the mixed screams and murmurs of the thronging crowds watching the metal filaments weaving their patterns. He elbowed back through the crowd. Faintly, through the rising crowd noise, he heard Eloise moaning his name. Sorry, baby, he yelled over his shoulder, putting his elbow into a fat woman's diaphragm. But I've been hungry too long to pass up a sweet deal like this. Excuse me, ma'am. Par me. Mac, excuse me. I'd like to, uh, get, uh, through here. Uh, thanks, Mac. And he was at the drugstore door. He adjusted his bow tie for a moment, muttering low to himself, Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Just look at this little Barty Chester. You're gonna make a million bucks. Yes, sir. He scrabbled for change as he slid into the booth. In another few minutes, he had placed the long-distance call, collect, to Mrs. Charles Chester in Wilmington, Delaware. He heard the phone ringing at the other end, then his mother's voice, Yes, hello. And he started to say, Hey, Ma! But the operator's voice cut through, Will you accept the charges, Mrs. Chester? When she had said yes, Bart threw himself into it. Hello, hello, Ma, how are ya? Why, Bart, how wonderful to hear from you. It's been so long. Just those few postcards. Yeah, yeah, I know, Ma. He cut her off. But things have been really jumping for me here in New York. Look, Ma, I need some money. Well, how much, Bart? I can let you have... I need a couple of hundred, Ma. It's the biggest. This is so hot, it's burning my pinkies. Honest to... He caught himself quickly. Gosh, Ma... I need the dough like I never did before. I can get it back to you in a few months, Ma. Please, Ma. I never asked you for nothing before. The next two minutes were a gradual wearing down period in which Mrs. Charles Chester promised to go to the bank and get the last 200 in sight. Bart thanked her most graciously. He ignored the operator's snide interjections to his mother waiting for charges she would have to pay. Then he was off the line and back on another. Hello, Irby. This is Bart. Look, I got a deal on that is without a doubt the most... Wait a minute, for heaven's sake, will ya? This is the greatest thing ever hit the... Five minutes and five hundred dollars later. Sandy, baby, who's this? Who you think? This is Bart. Bart Chest... Hey, don't hang up. This is a chance for you to make a million. A sweet, honest-to-goodness million. Now here's what I want. I want to borrow from you... Fifteen minutes, six phone calls, and $4,520 later, Bart Chester bolted from the drugstore, just in time to see the tentacled plate receding into the ship, the skin closing again. Eloise was, of course, gone. Bart didn't even notice. The crowds were by this time overflowing into the streets, though everyone was careful not to get under the structure and traffic blocked to a standstill all up the avenue. Motorists were perched on car hoods watching the machine. Fire trucks had been drawn up somehow. Rubber overcoated firemen stood about biting their lower lips and shaking their heads ineffectually. I've got to get in there. Got to get the edge on any other promoters. Visions of overflowing steam tables danced in Barchester's head. As he was pushing through the crowd back to the curb, he saw the police cordon forming. The beefy, spectacled cop was joining hands with a thin, harassed-looking blue coat as Chester got to them. "'Sorry, buddy, you can't go in there. We're shooing everyone out now,' the fat officer said over his shoulder. "'Look, officer, I gotta get in there.' At the negative shake from the cop, Chester exploded. Look, I'm Bart Chester, you know, Star Cavalcade of 1954, the Emory Brothers Circus. I produced them. 
I got to get in there. He could tell he was making no impression whatsoever. Look, you've got to... Hey, Inspector! Hey, over here! He waved frantically, and the short man in the drab overcoat paused as he headed toward the squad carpool. Taking care not to step on the microphone cables being laid along the street, he walked toward the crowd. Chester said to the cops, Look, I'm a friend of Inspector Kesselman. Inspector, he said imploringly, I've got to get in there. It's real important. Maybe a promotion. Kesselman began to shake his head no. Then he looked at Chester with narrowed eyes for a moment, remembering free tickets to the fights, and reluctantly bobbed his head in agreement. Okay, come on, he said with obvious distaste. But stay close. Chester ducked under the restraining arms of the cops, following the little man around the shadow of the structure. "'How's the promoting business, Chester?' asked the inspector as they walked. Barks felt his head grow light and begin to float off his shoulders. That was precisely the trouble. "'Lousy,' he said. "'Come over sometime for dinner if you get the time.' added the inspector in a tone that suggested Bart turn down the invite. Thanks, said Bart, carefully walking around the huge machine's shadow in the street. Is it a spaceship? asked Chester in almost a childlike tone. Kesselman turned and looked at him strangely. Where did you get that idea from? he asked. Chester shrugged his shoulders. Oh, just them comic books I've been reading. He smiled lopsidedly. "'You're crazy,' said Castleman, shaking his head as he turned away. Two hours later, when the last firemen had come down from the ladders, shaken their heads in failure, and said, "'Sorry, these acetylene torches don't even get the metal smoky,' and walked away. Kesselman still looked at Chester with annoyance and said, "'You're crazy.' An hour later, when they had ascertained definitely that machine gun bullets did not even dent the structure, he was less sure, but he refused to call the scientist Chester suggested. Damn it, Chester, this is my business, not yours. Now either you keep your trap shut, or I'll boot you out beyond the cordon. He gestured meaningfully at the throbbing crowds straining against the joined hands of the police. Chester subsided confident they would do as he had suggested, eventually. Eventually was one hour and fifty minutes later when Kesselman threw up his hands in despair and said, Okay, get your experts in here, but do it fast. This thing might settle any minute. Or, he added sarcastically, looking at the grinning Bart Chester, if there's any monsters in this thing, they may start eating us any minute now. It was a spaceship, or at any rate, it was from someplace else. The gray-faced scientists clucked knowingly to each other for a while. One of the braver experts climbed a fire ladder and tested the ship in some incomprehensible manner, and then they concurred. It is our opinion, said the scientist with the three snatches of hair erupting from an otherwise bald head, that this vehicle, am I speaking clearly enough for you reporters, this vehicle is from somewhere off Earth. Now, whether, he pointed out while the others nodded in agreement, this is a spaceship, or as seems more likely from the manner in which it appeared, a dimension-spanning device, I am not certain. But, he concluded, making washing movements with his hands, it is definitely of extraterrestrial origin. He spelled the six-syllable word, and the reporters went whooping off to the telephones. Chester grabbed Kesselman by the arm. Look, Inspector, who has say-so, jurisdiction, you know, over this thing? I mean, who would have say-so about entertainment rights and like that? Kesselman was looking at him as though he were insane. Chester started another sentence, but the screams from the crowd drowned him out. He looked up quickly. The skin of the spaceship was opening again. 
By the time the crowds had streamed into the crosstown streets, terror universally mirrored on every face, but mingled with an overwhelming curiosity. New Yorkers were once again torn between their native desire to watch and a fear of the unknown. Chester and the stubby-legged inspector found themselves walking backward, taking short steps, fearful steps, as they looked upward. Don't let them be monsters, Chester was almost praying. Or that beautiful meal ticket will be knocked off by the militia. The spaceship was motionless. It had not altered its original position by an inch, but a platform was extending, a transparent platform, so clear and so thin it seemed almost invisible. Six hundred feet up the ship's length, between two huge ribbed knobs extending as though they were growths, the platform slid out over Times Square. Get some guns on that thing, bellowed Kesselman at his men. Get up in those buildings. He pointed at two skyscrapers between which the spaceship hovered. Chester stared at the ship in fascination as the platform extended, then stopped. As he watched, a note was sounded. It rose in his mind, audibly yet soundlessly. He cocked his head to one side, listening. He could see police and slowly returning pedestrians doing the same. "'What's that?' he asked. The sound built, climbing from the hollow arch at the bottom of his feet to that last inch of each strand of hair on his head. It overwhelmed him, and his sight dimmed for a moment to be replaced by bursting lights and flickering shadows. In an instant his vision cleared, but he knew it had been a preamble. He knew, again without reason, the sound had come from the ship. He turned his eyes to the platform once more, just in time, to see the lines begin their forming. He could never quite describe what they were, and the only thing he knew for certain was that they were beautiful. The lines were suspended in air and of colors he had never known existed. They were parallel and crossed streamers that lived between the reds and blues of Earth. They were alien to his sight, yet completely arresting. He could not take his eyes from their wavering, shifting formations. Then the colors began to seep. Like running paints, the lines melted, forming, forming, forming in the air above platform. The colors intermingled and blended. Soon, a backdrop of shades blotted out the skin of the ship. What? What is it? He heard Kesselman ask faintly. Before he could answer, they came out. The beings appeared and stood silent for an instant. They were all different in bodily appearance, yet somehow Chester knew they were all alike underneath, as though they had donned coverings. In the instant they stood there motionless, he knew each by name. The purple-furred one on the left, he was Vasilio, the one with stalks growing where his eyes should have been, he was de Valier. The others, too, all bore names, and, oddly, Chester knew each one intimately. They did not repulse him for all their alienness. He knew Vasilio was stalwart and unflinching in the face of duty. He knew de Valier was a bit of a weakling, prone to crying in private. He knew all this and more. He knew each one personally. Yet they were all monstrous. Not one was shorter than forty feet. Their arms, when they had arms, were well-formed and properly sized for their bodies. Their legs, heads, torsos, the same. But few had arms and legs and torsos. One was a snail shape. Another seemed to be a ball of coruscating light. A third changed form and line even as Chester watched, pausing an instant in a strangely unidentifiable middle stage. Then they began moving. Their bodies positioned and swayed. They moved around one another intricately. Chester found himself enthralled. They were magnificent. Their motions, their actions, their attitudes in relation to one another were glorious. More 
they told a story, a deeply interesting story. The lines shifted and the merged colors changed. The aliens went through involved panoramas of descriptive motion. Not for a second did Chester consider he might stop watching them. They were something so alien, so different, yet so compelling. He knew he must watch them or forever lose the knowledge they were imparting with their movements. When the soundless note had sounded again, the colors had faded, the aliens were gone, and the platform had slid back. The spaceship was quiet and faceless once more. Chester realized that he was breathing with difficulty. They had been, well, literally breathtaking. He glanced at the huge clock in the Times building. Three hours had elapsed in the space of a second. The murmurs of the crowd, the strange applause for a performance they could not have fully understood, the feel of Kesselman's hand on his arm, all faded away. He heard the inspector's voice, so whispery in his ear. Good Lord! How marvelous! Even that was out of his range now. He knew, as he had known everything else, just what the ship was, who the aliens were, what they were doing on Earth. He heard himself saying it, quietly, almost with reverence. That was a play. They're actors. They were magnificent, and New York learned it only shortly before the rest of the world got wind of the news. Hotels and shops suddenly found themselves deluged by the largest tourist crowds in years. The city teemed with thousands of visitors drawn from all over the earth who wished to witness the miracle of the performance. The performance was always the same. The aliens came out onto their platform, their stage, really, every evening at precisely 8 o'clock. They were finished by 11. During the three hours, they maneuvered and postured. They filled their appreciative audiences with mixtures of awe and love and suspense, such as no other acting group had ever been able to do. Theaters in the Times Square area found they had to cancel their evening performances, Many shows closed, many switched to matinee runs and prayed. The performance went on. It was uncanny how each person who watched, enraptured, could find identification, find meaning, though everyone saw something a little different, though no words were spoken, though no comprehensible motions were made. It was uncanny how they could see the actors do the exact same things over and over each performance and never tire of it, come back to see it again. It was uncanny, yet beautiful. New York took the performance to its heart. After three weeks, the army was called away from the ship, which it had done nothing but produce the performance regularly each evening, to quell a prison riot in Minnesota, in five weeks, Bart Chester had made all the necessary arrangements, shoestring fashion, and was praying things wouldn't fizzle, as they had with the Emery Brothers' circus. He was still going without meals, moaning to those who would listen, What a lousy racket this is, but I got a deal on now that's... In seven weeks, Bart Chester had begun to make his first million. No one would pay to watch the performance, of course. Why should they when they could stand in the streets and see it? But there was still the unfathomable human nature factor with which to contend. There were still those who would rather sit in a gilded box seat, balcony style, hung from the outside of a metropolitan skyscraper, insured by Lloyd's to be sure, than stand in a gutter. There were still those who felt that popcorn and chocolate-covered almonds made preparation of watching more pleasant. There were still those who felt the show was common if they did not have a detailed program. Bart Chester, whose stomach had begun to bulge slightly beneath his new charcoal gray suit, took care of those things. Bart Chester Presents was scripted across the top of the programs and beneath it simply the performance. 
It was rumored up and down the street that Bart Chester was the new Saul Huruk, and a man which definitely we should all watch. During the first eight months of the performance, he made back all the borrowed money he had invested in building face leases and construction work. Everything from there on out was reasonably clear profit. The confection and souvenir concessions he leased for a 50% cut of the gross to the people who supplied ball games and wrestling matches. The performance went on regularly as an unquestionable smash hit. Variety said, E.T.'s Socko in Plush Review. The Times was no less sibulant with its praise. We found the performance on Times Square as refreshing and captivating at its first anniversary as it was on its opening night. Even the coarse commercial interests which have infected it could not dim the superlativeness of the... Bart Chester counted his receipts and smiled and grew fat for the first time in his life. The 2,289th performance was as brilliant and as satisfying as the first, the hundredth or the thousandth. Bart Chester sat back in his plush seat, only vaguely aware of the stunning girl beside him. Tomorrow she would be back, trying to get a break in some off-Broadway production, but tomorrow the performance would still be there, pouring money into his pockets. The major part of his mind concentrated, held in awe and wonder at the intricacy and glory of the actor's movements. A minor segment was thinking, as it always did with him. Wonderful. Marvelous. A true spectacle, like the New Yorker said. All around him, like perspiration on a huge beast, the Chester balconies clung to their buildings, the inexpensive seats between 45th and 46th Streets, the higher-priced boxes dotting the buildings all the way up to the Times Building. One of these days, those guys will break down and I'll be able to build on the Times, too, he thought. Over six years, what a run! Beat South Pacific! Damn it, wish I could have made all that in gate receipts! He frowned mentally, thinking of all the people watching from the streets, for free? The crowds were still as huge as the first day. People never seemed to tire of seeing the play. Over and over they watched it, enraptured, deep in it, not even noticing the flow of time. The performance always satisfied, always enchanted. They're fabulous players, he thought. Only... The thought was half-formed. Nebulous, annoying, but strangely, strangely annoying. There was no reason why he should feel qualms. Ah, oh, well. He concentrated on the play. It really took little concentration, for the actors spoke directly to the mind. Their charming appeal was to a deeper and clearer well than mere appreciation. He was not even aware when the tone of the play changed. At one point, the actors were performing a strangely exotic minuet of movement. A second later, they were all down near the front of the platform. That isn't in the play, he said, incredulously, the mood broken. The beautiful girl beside him grabbed at his sleeve. What do you mean, Bart? she asked. He shook her hand off in annoyance. I've seen this show hundreds of times. Right here, they all get around that little humpbacked bird thing and stroke it. What are they staring at? He was correct. The actors were looking down at their audience, who had begun to applaud nervously, sensing something was wrong. The aliens watched with stalks, with cilia, with eyes. They were staring at the people in the streets, on the balconies, seeming to see them for the first time since they'd arrived. Something was very wrong. Chester had felt it first, perhaps because he had been there from the beginning. The crowds were beginning to sense it also. They were milling in the streets, uncertainly. Chester found his voice tight and high as he said, There's, there's something wrong! What are they doing? 
when the platform sank slowly down the face of the ship, till finally one of the actors stepped off into the empty space beside the machine, he began to realize. It was only after the first few moments when the horror of the total carnage he knew was coming had worn off and he found himself staring fascinated as the little 40-foot humpbacked bird thing strode through Times Square that he knew. It had been a wonderful show and the actors had appreciated the intense interest and following of their audience. They had lived off the applause for over six years. They were artists without a doubt and up to a point they had starved for their art.